Our first presentation today will be Kent Dane, UC Cooperative Extension Specialist from UC Berkeley. And today he will be talking about black scale control. Um, has it changed much? So I'm gonna talk about a, an old pest today. This is actually one of the first insect pests that olive growers had to deal with. So if you look in the literature, it goes back to the 1910s when farmers were trying to figure out what to do with this insect pest. Um, it's probably from South Southern Africa in origin, and that's where most of our natural enemies come from. It has been at various times displaced by other insect pests when they entered California. So in the 1940s and 50s, olive scale became more important. And then we had a period of time when the olive fruit fly, which Cindy will talk about next, became more important. What surprises me is how little has changed since I did the research almost 40 years ago um, as a young graduate student. So we're gonna look at the, at the biology of it and some of the control tools. Uh, just an outline, we'll look at it as a pest the kind of damage it does, um, and I can put that into perspective with changing climate as well. We'll look at the research done on biological controls, why cultural practices are important to decrease pest damage, and then very briefly, the pesticide programs, which shockingly have not changed very much, and I'll bring up some of my concerns in terms of what insecticides might be available in the future. So we'll look at the possibility for new insecticides and I'll just touch briefly on mechanical harvesting. It's called a soft scale. So black scale is uh, strangely enough in the same order as things like aphids, it's a hemipteran, but they used to divide these up into two different categories. Um, black scale is more closely related to the hard scale such as the olive scale. Um, as an adult, it does have this hard shell-like outer um, shell or carapace, which protects the eggs inside. So on the left, you see two adult scale. And on the right, you see those two scale flipped upside down. Um, it's for the most part parthenogenic. That means we don't really have male scales, male black scales here in California. And turned upside down, we can see the adult has got those orange eggs underneath it. And one of the reasons it can be so damaging is that you can have up to a thousand eggs per individual adult scale. What I've done here is I've taken three adult scales in different stages of development to show you how these eggs are formed. So this is looking underneath, we flipped over those. And going from left to right, you can see in that one adult scale flipped upside down, uh, in the very center of it, you can see some eggs starting to form. So the bottom part of the adult becomes a storage area for eggs. The middle one has got quite a number of eggs in it, and the one on the far right, fewer eggs and some egg shells. So it becomes this storage unit for eggs, and as more eggs are laid, the actual body of the living adult female gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's like one of the sampling programs is to try to figure out how many eggs the adult still has underneath. Because for sprays like with oils, you want as many of those eggs hatched and outside as possible because they're protected underneath the adult. Um, we're now looking in the upper right at a close up picture of the eggs and the crawlers underneath the adult female. You can see some eggs in the upper right and you can see a crawler. You can actually see the two eye spots, the antenna, uh, and on the uh, right, lower right, we can see a crawler starting to move away from the adult scale. And in that one picture, you can see kind of a rim of white uh, right by all of those uh, scale eggs, a crawler. Those white shells are the egg shells. Crawlers have hatched and they're starting to move away. Uh, it's the crawler stage 
which is really the dispersal stage. That's the stage that starts to move away from the adult female and move to other feeding spots. Um, that's not to say that as a second or third instar, they can't move. So let's move up now to some of the bigger stages. So in the upper left, we can see some second instars, some third instars. And in the lower right, we can see rubber stages and some third instars. So I mentioned the crawler and the second are the most mobile stage. They tend to go out to the leaves to feed. The leaves are a little bit easier for them to get their mouth part into. Uh, just like mealybugs, just like aphids, they've got this piercing, sucking mouth part. Uh, they're phloem feeders, so they stick the mouth part into the phloem and feed. Um, they're, as mentioned, they're more common on the leaves as first and second instars, but that doesn't mean that as a third instar, they can't get up and move. They, they won't move very far, but they will go and they tend to move from the leaves to the twigs. And so you see them hatching in the springtime. Uh, you see them moving towards the leaves, feeding there, and then surviving during the summer, typically as first or second instars, and then moving towards the twigs, towards the larger branches as third instars, and even as rubber stages, they can get up and they can move a little bit. And that's where they're going to go to the, the fall and winter period. And this just shows the different stages from left to right. Um, a first instar or crawler, a second instar, a third instar, the rubber stage, and then the adult. Um, and again, there are no males in California. Uh, there are some males known uh, in South, Southern Africa, but we've never spotted one here for this species. So they're parthenogenic. The feeding itself really is not the main damage that's caused by this insect. It's as they feed, they produce honeydew. And we can see this here. These are, um, I'd say third instar going towards rubber stage. So the ones on the left are closer to third instar. The two bigger one are starting to become rubber stages. And we can see from the ones on the top they still have got kind of this flattened oval look to them. As they become more mature, going towards more of this rubber stage, they'll, they won't, they'll start to increase not just in size, but they also get taller. Um, and that's the main difference between the immature third and start going towards a rubber stage. In the rubber stage, they're starting to develop their ovaries, and they're getting ready to produce eggs. And then as the carapace, that outer skin gets harder and harder and turns darker and darker, it'll go from this um, rubber stage where you can still see that H pattern on the back. And this distinguishes it from some of the other soft scales. And if I can outline here, this is what we mean. Here's one line, another line, and then the cross. That's that capital H pattern that you see with black scale. And they'll get taller and taller, and that's when you know they're starting to form um, eggs underneath there. And it's this period of development from that third instar to rubber stage to adult, which you can find them both in the fall, but they tend to overwinter in these stages. And then in the spring, going to the adult, that rapid increase in size is when they produce most of their honeydew and cause most of their damage. So this is a, a picture. This is out of uh, Corning, California. And we can see on this twig here, all of these black adults. So these, this is probably sometime around April. Um, they overwinter again as a third or rubber stage. And in the springtime, they've got this rapid development to the adult stage. And just imagine here, we've got probably, going down this twig, probably something close to 100 different adults. As crawlers, this would have caused very little damage. But as adults, all that production, all that growth, all that honeydew, um, the honeydew 
covers the leaves, it reduces photosynthesis, and it causes defoliation. And so you can get patterns of leaf drop like this. Uh, you can see here all this darkness is from the honeydew. All these leaves will probably fall off, drop off, a huge decrease in photosynthesis and damage to the tree. So we'll look at some of this older research done in the past. We'll start with the different biological controls um, and then go into cultural practice and pesticide. So when I did this work, I sampled in three areas. I sampled in Northern California, Central California, and Southern California, um, all in the Central Valley, and looked at different levels of natural control and looked at the different development patterns of the um, black scale with respect to different types of growing olives. Um, parasitoids were the most important natural enemy. Uh, this is the most important of the parasitoids. Uh, Metaphycus helvelis, it, is, it was imported from South Africa. This is a very clear example of a second instar. We can see that H pattern starting to form with a first instar or crawler, which is dead behind it. This dead first instar might have died because one of the important things about this parasitoid is that it host feeds. So on the right, we see an example of host feeding. Um, the parasitoid takes its ovipositor and finds a first instar that might be too small for it to lay an egg in to have it become a, a good host for a parasitoid. So what it does instead is it takes its ovipositor, that's like the stinger of a bee, and it goes into the first instar and it just slashes that with its ovipositor. And then you can see down here in this lower picture, it actually um, picks up that, that first instar where it cut it and where all the, the body fluid is coming out, it will feed on that body fluid. So this Metaphycus hevelis can kill a lot more scale by host feeding, feeding than by ovipositing and having another uh, parasite come out. So it attacks the younger stages, second and third instars. And that's how you know it's a Metaphycus helvelis because it's attacking the younger stages. And you can see that right here. Uh, this is the mummy or the cadaver. This probably was a Metaphycus helvelis coming out of that. It could have been a Bartlett eye because there's just one, but one single exit hole, we're gonna suggest that's Metaphycus helvelis. Uh, an, another important parasitoid is Metaphycus lounsbrii. It used to be called Bartlett eye. Um, we can see here, it likes to attack older scale. So now it's putting eggs into a rubber stage. You can see again the height as it's getting a little bit taller, ready to produce its eggs. It likes to attack the larger stages because it likes to put more than one egg into a host. Sometimes we've gotten as many as 15, 16 adult parasites out of one black scale. And you can see that here, uh, usually it exits when the scale becomes an adult. Here's one hole, here's another hole. So it, again, it attacks third and start of rubber stages and they usually come out of the adult. Another parasitoid, um, Metaphycus hageni, uh, very similar species as Metaphycus anarchy. It also likes to attack third instars and rubber stages. Um, it doesn't put as many eggs into each one. So typically you see a larger hole coming out of a rubber stage or an adult. And typically there's two or three of these parasites that exit um, from the adult. Also important, but in terms of ranking your Metaphycus helvelis, attacking the smaller stages will be a better parasitoid, and it attacks the smaller stages before they cause more of that honeydew damage. And the fourth parasitoid I'll talk about, also important, is the Scutalista. Uh, you can tell it looks very different than the others. The other two were inserted. Uh, this is a pteromallid. It looks like a little tank as it goes through the, the field looking for black scale. It actually could be categorized more as a predator than a parasitoid. We can see that it will attack 
um, the adult scale and it actually will slip its egg underneath the carapace. This is an adult scale turned upside down. We can see the adult body and we can see all the eggs here. And you can see this little larva right there. That actually is the parasitoid larva. So it puts its egg underneath the scale. The parasitoid larva then goes through here and just feeds on all these eggs underneath the scale. And so it will then pupate, become an adult and chew its way out. And that's why the exit hole is at the bottom of the scale for this one, whereas with the Metaphyca species, the exit holes will typically be at the top because they're feeding on the scale adult female's body, whereas this is feeding on the eggs. We've also got a lot of impact from predators such as green lacewings and lady beetles. All together, I've just talked about the most important, so of the parasitoids, those four species, and of the predators, it's the um, lacewings and the lady beetles, but there's all kinds of other natural enemies out there that play a role. Um, there's about 10 different parasitoid species. I just gave you the most important. Now, parasitoid densities can fluctuate quite a bit. Ants are the most important thing causing those fluctuations. I should get some more videos for this for the black scale, but it's the same idea. Here's a parasitoid attacking a mealybug. And we can see the ants in front. Ants will tend the mealybugs to get the honeydew off of them. Um, and in turn, what they do for the scale or for the mealybug is that they, they protect it from natural enemies. So we see here a parasitoid just put an egg inside the mealybug. It's going back in the distance and ants will do a number of things with their antennae and that includes smell. It's got, it's got a tactile response. So that ant in front knows something happened with this mealybug. It's more on defense. And we can see now when the parasite comes back to try to find some more mealybugs, same thing with scale, the ant is on guard, it's aware, and it attacks and kills that parasitoid. So very simply, um, ant excluded in red, ant tended in, in blue or black, um, parasitism is higher when you don't have ants. So one of the downsides of the natural enemies is that if you've got ants tending them, the parasites don't do as good of a job. So let's look now, we'll kind of end this, uh, getting towards our conclusion, with looking at what you can do to reduce black scale numbers. The most important thing is your canopy management. If you've got a closed canopy, it creates a different microclimate inside than on the outside. It reduces the amount of airflow and it, it reduces the temperatures inside the canopy. And that's very good for the scale in the Central Valley because it's right at the edge of temperatures it can withstand. So what we found is that with closed canopies, we get more scale in the interior parts of the olive tree. They build up higher populations. And then if we get a mild spring and a mild summer, that population can explode. And it's also more difficult to get the oils um, into the inner canopy parts when it's a dense canopy to get contact with your pesticide and get killed. And that was just shown in this, this older work done in the 1980s, where populations were fairly steady in the first, second, and third year. But then in the fourth year, with all of a sudden you get mild spring and summer, and the population just took off. In contrast, a more open canopy allows air circulation to go inside. And when we've got that that warmer air, that drier air inside, we tend to have lower scale densities. And this is seen here, this, these, are, these are the same years, um, same region. Um, first one had the open, the closed canopy. This is an open canopy. We can see um, in that 1985, 1986, 
when there were warmer years, the population really crashed. So in 87, when we had that cooler spring and summer, the population really didn't go very far. This was on a log scale, so it was close to 100-fold higher in that other tree canopy. And uh, the last canopy I'll talk about is really found only in uh, really, really old orchards where they had basically very tall trees, open center, ground cover. It created two microclimates and it did change the biology of the scale. So usually the scale was um, either univoltine or two generations per year. This created kind of an overlap because you had such different temperatures down below than you did up above. So we'll look at that next like this. The closed and open canopy tended to have one generation per year with some overlap of stages. The two microclimate canopy tended to have up to two generations per year and a lot of overlap of stages. So you can see up above, we were getting first instars from about April to August at the longest period. Um, there were large periods where there were no seconds, no thirds, or no rubber stages or adults. So in these closed and open canopies, I found very few parasitoids. In the canopy with closer development stages to each other, the graph down below, we tended to have more natural enemies. And that's because if the metaphycus helveless attacks second and third instars, in the upper graph, there's long periods where you don't find second or third instars, especially during the warm summer periods. Uh, and so that causes that parasite population to crash and to fall out. So summary of this older work is that canopy management became very important. The open canopies allowed the heat to come in, allowed dry uh, heat, and that was best for controlling. Typically, we're getting anywhere from 80 to 95% of those first instars dying during the summer. Um, very few of them survive to that fall period and they really don't cause a lot of damage during the summer because they're, they're just barely holding on, not a lot of honeydew being produced. Biological controls help manage the scale, but they tend to be better in these older orchards where you've got um, two or one and a half generations per year. Uh, it became important to me to monitor for the presence, presence of honeydew so you know when you can treat, you know when a population might explode you know, uh, whenever you get those cool summer periods. Uh, we developed a monitoring program, and I know not all growers are doing it all the time. So I really like at, at harvest time to check for honeydew. I check 25, 30 trees uh, in these two periods of honeydew accumulation. That's April, uh, when they're going from uh, rubber stage to adult. And then October, when they're going from second instar to third instar. And if you see honeydew accumulation, uh, then start to look for uh, actual adult populations. So if I see honeydew, then that next period I'd start to look for adults, especially in April, May, focusing on two or three areas in each block, especially those areas that had some scale problems in the past. Um, select about 10 trees in each area and count the number of adults, this is in the springtime, on the terminal 18 inches of about 10 branches per tree. So about 100 branches total. This is very, very fast to do. So two or three areas, 100 branches in each area. And we broke it apart like this. If you're not seeing any adult, you found honeydew, but we're not finding any adults. Scale is there. Maybe monitor again later in the season, but maybe you don't need to treat. If you find one to four scale per that 10 branch sample in each area, that's just one adult on 10 branches. Um, it's a moderate population. 
typically with moderate populations, I can control this with a, an oil application. If you've got something more than that, like four to 10 scale on that 10 branch sample, you're gonna to have to treat with something more than an oil. And if you've got severe, more than 10 scale per 10 branch, you probably had a black scale population in there for two or three years building up and just didn't catch it. So pesticide programs, this gets very simple because it hasn't changed much in all these years. Uh, these, these bad infestations, like the picture you're seeing here, they take more than a year to develop. That's a population that's been there probably for two or three years. And mild temperatures, again, it just took off. So if you've got a, a light or moderate population, um, typically you're going after that smaller first instar, second instar population. Oftentimes you can control this with an oil spray in spring or summer. Watch for temperatures so you don't get any, any burn on the leaves. If you've got one of these heavy or severe populations, typically you're looking at a seven or superside. Um, check with registrations. I know that these materials are not gonna be around for a long time. Um, I just looked at the UC IPM website and they're still being listed. Um, they usually have some restrictions and usually they're considered as oftentimes as a post-harvest treatment. Um, I'm happy to see that we've got some IGRs now registered. I think esteem is. It would be great if we could get some other insect growth regulators registered as well, just in case the seven and superside are removed from our use in the future. So one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about, worried about, um, I know mechanical harvesting is becoming more common, especially for olives on, um, for olive oil. And this tends to have that closed canopy. So you get the benefits of mechanical harvesting, but it might lead to increases in black scale. Um, if people are seeing that, please give me a holler. Um, I'd like to go out there and take a look at it. And again, these closed canopies tend to improve conditions for the scale, but not for those parasitoids that I mentioned. So it's something I wanted to, to monitor. Um, and so if you are seeing this, please let me know. Um, and so that's the end. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And I think I've got two or three minutes for questions. Thank you, Kent. Um, you do have a couple of questions. Um, and let's see, are there any organic chemicals other than oil for scale control? You know, um, you can use you can use soaps as well. Um, the oils work better for the scale. And for all of these organic programs, what you really have to remember is that uh, they're not very good against the older stages. So the soap, the oil, basically a soap uh, is going to desiccate um, the insect. And it works much better against something like an aphid that's got a little bit softer, thinner integument, that cuticle, that outside. The oil is going to uh, suffocate the scale. Uh, the scale is breathing through little pores called spiracles on the side of it. And if you put an oil on and it clogs up those spiracles, the insect can't breathe. And it also kind of coats it with uh, that, you know, you, you put on oil, you go out in the sun and you burn. It's the same thing with the scale. So the scale are coming out in April, May, even into June, uh, depending on your, your orchard canopy. And you've got these thousands and thousands of crawlers coming out there. And a lot of them are gonna die just on their own. But if you put an oil on at that time and you get um, that extra additional heat units on those scale, then it, that's what's gonna kill them. Um, but there aren't any, any other materials that I know of other than the soaps and the oils that are registered uh, that will work against this scale. Okay. There are currently nothing new for black scale that is approved for certified organic growers. I guess that should be a question. That's the same kind of question, yeah. Is ant control in olives a good idea? Yes, it is. 
Um, we are working with new ant controls in vineyards using the polyacrylamide baits. This is something that Monica Cooper started in vineyards and it's been used in citrus. Um, and if you can control your, if you can bring down the scale population, it helps bring down the ant population, but there's a delayed, in, a delayed effect. Okay, there's a couple more questions um, in the Q&A, if you don't mind. Um, I can answer them online too. That would be great. Um, great. I'm going to put my presentation up. Thank you so much, Kent. For Thank you.